good morning, everybody. My name is Charlotte Constance. I'm from Conductor and very happy to have you all here today. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to look at the spaces and places we inhabit um, and how they affect our ability to thrive. Thank you to the BPF uh, for hosting us today and to our fantastic group of panelists. Um, the webinar will be chaired by myself and um, together with co-owner of Conductor, David Stevens. If you can give us a little wave, David. Um, and together with our team at Conductor, we bring science and soul to spaces and places. Today, we are joined by a very interesting group of thought leaders coming from a diverse set of backgrounds, but all with a common goal of being more conscious about the spaces and places that we create. Uh, we'll start off with Melissa. Melissa Zanoka is Head of Programs for the Infrastructure Clients Group. They bring together the most progressive economic infrastructure clients to accelerate improvements in the delivery and development of UK infrastructure. She is one of the team that coordinated our vision for the built environment and was part of the drafting team for the government's Transforming Infrastructure Performance Roadmap to 2030. She's also a member of the World Economic Forum Infrastructure 4.0 community. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Buran, if you can give us a, a little hello there. <laughs> Buran Desai is a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer, author, and advisor to companies and government. He studied medical sciences and neuro neuroscience at Oxford and Cambridge Universities before co-founding environmental organization Bioregional in 1994. He created the UK's first zero carbon village of 100 homes. And in 2002, he coined the term One Planet Living, creating an international initiative, which hopefully he'll tell us a little bit more about. His transformative approach was used for the London 2012 Olympics, One Planet Games, and was the inspiration for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals adopted by all UN member states in 2015. And on to Dr. Nigel Oslin. Nigel, give us, Hello. there we go. Uh, Nigel is an environmental psychologist, researcher, workplace strategist, change manager, public speaker, and author. Nigel is internationally recognized as an expert in post-occupancy evaluation, impact of design on performance, agile working, psychophysics, and the psychology of the workplace. He created the module on well-being in buildings, which is part of the new MSc in Health. Nigel has published over 100 academic papers, books, and guides, and his latest book, Beyond the Workplace Zoo, Humanizing the Office is due to be released in September, but if you have a check on Amazon, it's available for pre-order now. And I've scanned a few pages and I think it's gonna be a very good read. So let's get on to why we're all here today. So together with our insight partner, Opinion, conductors set out to undertake a thought-provoking quarterly survey of 2000 UK-wide participants. Our aim is to firstly ascertain what thriving means to people, to determine whether we are currently thriving, whether our communities are thriving, and then to drill down into thriving in the context of the spaces and places we are connected to, from our homes and workplaces through to our neighborhoods. We now have results from Q1 and Q2 of this year. And today we're going to be presenting just some of the findings. There's a lot in there. There's a lot of data. But for the purposes of today, we'll look at some themes and then discuss each theme with our panelists as we go. If you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A section, not the chat, because then we'll be able to have a record of them and answer them at a later stage um, if we need to but we're gonna try and deal with them as we go. And if not, we'll have some time at the end. And we also have two polls that will ping up on your screen. And we'd really love you to participate in them as they relate uh, back to the questions that we've asked in our survey. And we'll be able to compare how our audience is uh, doing compared to the wider UK. So I'm going to hand over to David um, to give us our kind of first set of insights. 
Great. Thank you, Charlotte. As conductor, well before we even started this series, uh, we've done a lot of research into thriving. So through a combination of looking at academic papers, speaking to a lot of experts throughout on what thriving was really about. So we have a framework with the six words you can see there on the, the screen, happy, secure, energized, inspired, value, and connected. And so we asked our audience in the surveys what they expected or what they associated with someone who is thriving. So not themselves, but importantly, someone. So to sort of depersonalize it a little bit. So what jumps out there, as you can see, is quite clearly happiness is key. Um, it sits head and shoulders above all the other factors that... Um, that we asked and even got slightly stronger as we moved from Q1 to Q2. You then have this bunching of secure and energized, so sort of getting reasonably similar scores, at least in the Q2. And then at the other end, we have the concepts of value and connected, sort of getting the lowest scores. Now, as you can see, the numbers don't add up to 100 here. They, um, people got the option to choose as many words as they want. From our point, I think what jumps out here is the fact that as we said happiness at the at the top of the list and also security coming through as as key consistent themes we're surprised by the low scores must admit the value and connected got and we think that this probably represents a slightly sort of greater delays in people's thinking at this point in time that these are not concepts that people think that's important for us to, to thrive to, in our daily lives. So won't go into that more, but we're going to be very interested in what the sort of panel thinks of those concepts. When we went later in the survey and then asked people to personalise it, put it into their own words, the definitions of thriving, again, happiness jumped out significantly for us. So what it head and shoulders sort of above the rest, but health and well-being also came in as a, as a significant factor. And then when people were personalising it, personal goals around the concepts of success, personal growth, and then some of the more themes came in like contentment and, uh, and security that you can see. And then we asked them, well, what do the survey, what do we think supports an individual's ability to thrive? And when we asked this, it was very interesting that the concepts of physical and mental emotional health came to the, the fore. To us, what was surprising here was that, you know, when we had a look at the definition of thriving, people spoke about being healthy and well-being right at the top of their list. But they also mentioned that as the top factors in supporting individuals to thrive. So it leaves a bit of an open question for us here. Okay, is something like our physical and our mental health truly an input to the model of people thriving or is it an output? I.e., you know, do we need it to thrive or does it represent us thriving? And then as a, as a final point just to make here, I think it's important to say that if you look at the other four factors on supporting, they're really the factors of about our environment, either, you know, how we spend our time or what we surround ourselves with. And it's interesting that when we talk about support, that people have listed all of those factors below actually their physical and their mental health. Lots of other interesting stuff, as Charlotte's mentioned in here, there's a million ways to cut this data. And I think so one thing that uh, sort of just add that we found particularly interesting is when we looked at some of those factors that we mentioned in the first place, like happiness, Happiness is consistent across the board, whether it's different age groups, whether it's different demographics in society. But when you get into some of the other factors, it is interesting to see how they break down, particularly the concepts of um, connected and valued and inspired. When you look at the demographics, particularly the younger people are much more influenced by these factors than the older people. So I'll leave it there. because Great. Yeah, Thank you, David. Yeah, to listen to. So, um, Puran, if we could start with some, some thoughts from you, please. We know that you have created a, a, a 10 principle sustainability framework and there's a list and when we spoke, you told us about the shift in, in the kind of order with health and happiness, 
you know, this is long, long before the survey um, taking the kind of top spot. I think we'd love to understand a little bit more about the framework that you use and also why, why for you health and happiness are at the top of the list in, in creating kind of sustainable places. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Um, uh, well, actually, I've created a framework called One Planet Living. So this was back in uh, 2002, so a, a long time ago, almost uh, uh, 20 years ago. And we had uh, 10 principles, and this was uh, after building our um, eco-village, BZ, Bennington Zero Fossil Energy Development in South London. You know, we wanted to see, well, well, how could we help others uh, build similar places or, you know, even better places? Um, so uh, created 10 principles uh, from zero carbon energy and zero waste, um, uh, land and nature, through to things like uh, uh, equity and local economy, cultural and community and health and happiness. All were equally important, but uh, uh, we, we had to put them in a list. So we started with zero <laughs> carbon. Uh, but after about 10 years of doing this, we decided just to flip the order around and just really start talking to people about health and happiness, because that's really what people were interested in. The engineers would just get stuck in definitions of zero carbon and carbon accounting. But actually, we were more interested in, in how can we play, create places where uh, actually, people could thrive and create that sort of lifestyle. So what what is it that contributes to health and happiness? And ultimately, um, you know, renewable energy is going to contribute to our, our health and happiness um, uh, because we know, you know, climate change is a is, is a threat to us thriving. So, uh, yeah, I mean, health and happiness is, is something that we all um you know, is vitally important to us. And, and as this survey shows, is, is right on the top of the list of what people think is important to them. So let's start that conversation there and then look at services, products or whatever, which, which can help support people in their, um, in their happiness and their health. Great, thank you. And, and Nigel, I think from a kind of academic perspective, um, we were talking yesterday about what you call the kind of hygiene factors. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about that, please. Sure, yeah. Well, as, as a psychologist, we're, we're taught early on about motivational theory, and there's two motivational theories that I really like, and you're probably aware of them, or well, the audience will be um, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs and Hertzberg's Motivational Theory. And both of them say that there's different levels of needs that have to be met in, a, in an order in order for you to fully self-actualize, to be happy, to thrive, to perform and to have like maximum well-being. So the lower order needs tend to be more about health and safety and security and comfort. Uh, so maybe the spaces where people work and where people live. But you have to satisfy those first. And then we move on to those higher order needs, which start with things like a sense of belonging. So interacting with others and then move on to the more conceptual things like uh, well-being and emotional health and so on. So I, I think the results are actually supporting that kind of basic psychological theory that I love. As I say, just just help us understand that there's certain things we have to uh, allow we have to provide for people in order for them to fully thrive yeah and I think that's interesting what we discussed yesterday was um, in our world of, of the built environment we often go to the detail and try and you know go a few layers up before we really deal with the basic needs yeah um, I, I think um, I, I think designers love designing spaces so and they tend to focus on the visual and things like how it looks and feels and some of the quirky environments but it's those basic as you said hygiene factors like temperature noise air quality that we sometimes forget about and they're actually quite difficult to get right because individuals all have different uh, different requirements but those are the things when you look at the surveys my own surveys i've done about 100 office surveys i've also done ones in homes and as uh, many of the audience will know about the Leesman Index, which has looked at hundreds of buildings. And it's those hygiene factors, uh, temperature, noise, air quality, that keep coming up as the, the stumbling blocks to creating uh, environments that allow us to thrive and flourish. Thanks, Nigel. And Melissa, um, the vision for the built environment, um, I'm just going to say flourishing systems how how what does that mean and and how is it going to be used and in order to support people in their ability to thrive 
Yeah, thank you. So in April of this year, the Built Environment got together um, as a sector, basically, to articulate our vision for the Built Environment. We had interviews and workshops with individuals from across the Built Environment, and that including the, the property industry and real estate. Um, and the vision states that the explicit purpose of the Built Environment is to enable people and nature to flourish together for generations. Um, and it, it recognises that the, um, the built and the natural environments are complex and interconnected systems and that whether people thrive or not um, actually depends on the services that um, these systems provide um, and not on focusing on the individual assets themselves. So, you know, we don't need a house. We need shelter and warmth. It's kind of what, what Dave was uh, saying as well. And um, so the spaces that we live and work in inextricably linked to our happiness and our mental health but we don't currently have the vehicles or processes in place to reflect this at a community level or to necessarily get input from the users themselves. So the first step to resolving this was articulating the future that we want in our vision. Um, and then the government's about to publish the Transforming and Structured Performance Roadmaps 2030. And that has a specific strand on place uh, and it helps to translate the vision into policy. Fantastic. And I know that we are very much aligned when um, we, we're thinking about ask people, <laughs> please, you know, who are the participants of these spaces and places and ask them. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get on to that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, okay, we're going to move on to the next set of insights. Uh, Gail, please could we have our first poll and if we could have some participation, that would be absolutely fantastic. There we go. So you can fill that in while David is giving us our next set of insights. Over to you, David. This is one of the things that we've been really wanting to get in place for quite some time now, and these surveys gave us the perfect opportunity. Um, so just reminding people, there's 2,000 people each quarter. So any of you that are sort of stats geeks like me know that that represents a significant meaningful survey to get results from and consistency when comparing over time. Um, so the, the Thrive Score, not huge science behind it. You know, zero, you know, we'd have to say as individuals, we're all at rock bottom. And if we're 100, we'd be knocking it out of the park every single time. The, the score has moved in a positive direction from Q1 to Q2, which is in line with our expectations. Um, a three-point move from 41 to 44. I think the... The fact here that the score, what's what's benchmark? What would we be expecting? We think about 65 is a score to say that we're thriving in general. So as individuals, we've got a fair way to go, we believe, on this score. Positive that come out of the survey is the move from Q1 to Q2. We think that that's you know, associated you know, with a lightning of sort of lockdown measures and I'm sure there's a number of other factors that I won't go into because again the panels you know better experts to talk about that. well I think Pura might say it's the sunshine <laughs> but actually I'm not sure that that's actually the case <laughs> this summer <laughs> absolutely and I think what's also um, important here that we don't have it up on screen but in the report we also asked a question associated with this is how do people feel the question we ask them reflects their state of mind over a longer period of time. And what was really interesting in that is the people that voted that they were thriving more of the time aligned to people that were more consistent in their mindset, um, which is a positive. So they're, they're thriving more of the time and they feel they don't sort of jump back and forth. More of the people that said they were rarely thriving or thriving none of the time voted for the fact that that was either a temporary phase or that they flipped back and forth. And I think that is a positive as well. And it also gives information about the current, you know, state that a lot of us are in, you know, with lockdown measures and the, and the general feelings in, um, in society. So I think that's an extra bit of positivity on top of the positive mood in this uh, ratio that we've seen. As always, when we drill down, there's some really interesting themes that come through. I won't go into lots of them, but I'll just give a couple of samples here. What happened from Q1 from Q1 to Q2 is that 
uh, women's thrive scores jump much more than men's. They're up 4.5 points versus 1.5 for the men, and they now actually have a higher overall thrive score, albeit only marginally over the men. What happened is we, we break the age groups down into three core buckets below 34, 34 to 55, and 55 plus, and we saw that middle bracket actually jump by the most from quarter to quarter. But interestingly, consistently, the, the older group is still the highest scoring people, even though they move the least between the two quarters. Um, if you're 55 plus, the, the Thrive score is actually 46.7 at the moment. Parents have higher Thrive scores than non-parents by quite some margin. They've got a Thrive score of 46 versus 41 for the non-parents. And then less surprising, I suppose, overall, but the starkness in the numbers between people in employment versus not. The unemployed only have a Thrive score of 27.3. Um, and that really didn't change from quarter to quarter. Interestingly, part-time employment has a higher Thrive score of 48 uh, versus 44 for people in full-time employment, and they move the most from quarter to quarter. And then finally, to really emphasise you know, some of the socioeconomic trends, if you earn over 40K a year, you've got a Thrive score of 50.8 versus 40.9 for people earning less than 20K. So some pretty sort of stark numbers to support what I suppose a lot of us would have a gut feel, but when you start seeing it in numbers like that, it really uh, yeah, hits us in the face there. So I think I'll stop there, um, Charlotte, and I'll let you hand it over to the, uh, the panel. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, Melissa, um, let's start with you. So we know that um, individuals seem to be placing more importance on their own health both mentally and physically, uh, rather than on the environment that surrounds them. How do you think that our environments could work harder in supporting our ability to thrive? Well, I think that at the moment, um, we concentrate mainly on building new things and on adding to the built environments, and, and often at the expense of nature, um, without necessarily putting the communities and the user of the things that we're building at the heart of the purpose. Um, and as I was saying earlier, the built environment has become a complex system of connected assets and networks across social and economic infrastructure. And then there are many interfaces with the natural environment. And now we're starting to get further into connections um, as we link up the physical and the digital worlds. Um, and so it's becoming obvious that uh, the built environment is actually a deeply interconnected system of systems. So to answer your question, we basically need to manage it in that way if we want to ensure that people thrive, both physically and mentally. And that includes acknowledging the link between our thriving and that of nature. So that means a shift towards consciously making a positive environmental impact with everything that we um, do in the built environment. So that could be um, integrating regenerative design and ecosystem services, natural infrastructure and, and things like um, nature-based solutions. Fantastic. And, and Nigel, from your, for your perspective as a psychologist, do you, do you think that people really kind of understand or consciously think about the impact that the environment, nature, built environment has on them. Do people really pay attention to that, that stuff? There's lots of evidence out there to show that the environment does have a, 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 an, an impact and, and hopefully most of the time a benefit to, for people. Uh, and I'm very evidence led. So it's a funny question for me because on the, on the one hand, um, I, I worked with a facilities management company for, for a while and, and we certainly felt that people only noticed their environment and the impact of it when it went wrong so it was always about complaining that the temperature wasn't right or the air quality they, they never came to us and said oh the air quality is beautiful today thank you for sorting that out so it, it was it was only they only noticed it when it went wrong and I think that relates back to my previous comment about the hierarchy of needs and the hygiene factors we only notice the things at the bottom when they when they go wrong but but having said that um there is a lot of work out there that shows the benefit. And, and a piece of work I was particularly interested in was one can uh, one as part of the Leesman Index, which is this massive world, worldwide uh, survey. 
And they found when they looked at people who were working agile and had the freedom to choose where and when they work, they found that they were starting to select the spaces within an office that made them most comfortable. So rather than always sitting next to their colleagues and in little team zones, they were actually starting to choose spaces where the daylight was what they preferred, the level of lighting or the, the level of, of sound and noise levels were what they preferred or the temperature is what they preferred. Because even in a, a an air conditioned, uh, environmentally controlled building, there's still hot spots and cold spots and light areas and noisy areas and quiet areas. So I thought that that was particularly interesting. And I think what the industry is also doing is, is to help people be more conscious of the impact of, of the workspaces and living spaces on, on, on their well-being is um, you've got things like the well standard and fit well which are starting to introduce quite complicated checklists uh, so that we can start to design buildings that can contribute to, to people's well-being so uh, mixed mixed thoughts on that one I, I think probably. yeah I think and I think you know it's interesting that the, the we're dealing with something that's kind of you know happiness thriving, it's almost intangible and we're bringing it back to a set of ticks in the box. And I think it's going to be, well, I think maybe Puran, what's your view as a, somebody who's a developer and has developed places, um, you know, is it, you know, do people know what makes them happy? Is it the responsibility of the developer or the asset manager? Um, to, to create happy places, you know, where does, where, who, whose response, is it our own responsibilities as individuals or should we hand that responsibility over to other people? Uh, it's a combination of different things. You know, first of all, I think we don't know what makes us happy. Uh, we're having this conversation yesterday and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and Nigel pointed out uh, that, that actually the, uh, the best indicator of, of happiness is low expectations, you know. But there is some truth in that. We have created a society where we are not grateful for what we've got. Um, we've created a consumer society where advertising is always telling us all the things we haven't got. So no wonder, you know, we um, uh, we feel inadequate or we don't have enough. Um, uh, you know, so so part of it is our responsibility in developing a uh, what you might call a positive psychology, uh, developing that um, uh, that attitude ourselves of um, of being a bit more grateful for what we have got because we have got a lot. Um, uh, um, but also, I, 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 I would say, you know, there's, there's good evidence. We, we know what, what makes people happy. So if people are healthier, generally they are happier. And we know, for example, that if people walk and cycle more, um, uh, uh, you know, they're going to be healthier. We tackle the epidemic of uh, obesity, diabetes. So going back to my sort of medical sciences background. Uh, and those can be designed into communities. So I think... Um, uh, developers, planners, uh, um, uh, you know, asset managers do have a responsibility to start creating places where uh, um, people, um, you know, are more likely to lead uh, healthier and, and, and happier lives. And so we can bring that um, uh, across, of course, um, and we can ask people. But so, so we need a combination of different things, you know, recognising that we don't often know what makes us happy and uh, we can use evidence um, uh, and all the research that has been done on, on what makes people happy, uh, use that quite um, scientifically to uh, design places. And, you know, we're one of the first developers, if not the first developer I knew of, where we actually wrote a formal health and happiness plan uh, for our residents uh, when we designed um, a, a scheme in joint venture with uh, Cress Nicholson called One Brighton. Um, yeah, so, so I think we can take that on board. Um, uh, and, and we can help design places where people are more likely to be healthier and happier. And I think that's absolutely vital now. And I think, you know, our industry definitely, we jump on to different things. So, you know, at one time it was, it was, you know, all about sustainability, then it was all about communities, and now it seems to be about health and well-being. And I think there's, you know, oftentimes kind of, oh, we've put a running track somewhere or a cycle path. And so it, this is a healthy place to live. Um, and I think what you're advocating and, and, and everybody on our panel and conductor as well is it, it has to be woven into the fabric of, of the place from the very beginning. And it has to be as a result of asking people what they want from that place or that space. And, um, you know, as opposed to, 
assuming that everybody wants to put on their, you know, cycling shorts on a Saturday <laughs> or, you know, I don't know, do the obvious gym workout. And actually, and, and, and David, you know, if, if anyone in the audience, you know, wants to find out more, we've got a whole, his, a whole list now of, you know, you know, open-ended questions, 4,000 people over the last six months saying what makes them thrive. Um, and we've got to start asking people more and more and integrating. And I, and I love the sound of the, the health and happiness plan. And, you know, it's, it's got to come into place-making strategies. It's, it's got to be kind of at, at the fore. Um, thank you so much. And David, just briefly, because I'm very conscious of, of, of our time, but, you know, importantly for our audience, just an insight into one of our kind of segments, which is uh, people in shared accommodation. Could you just give us a one minute kind of insight into that, please? Absolutely. As we say, we, we have a look at the different segments of how people live when we break down our data. And it's one of my favourite areas here. So in having a look at two elements of the sharer community, one being what we might call the more traditional HMO setup, and then people sort of also living with multiple generations of their family at an adult stage of their life. We see that this is one of the groups that's been affected the most they had the lowest Thrive score of any living arrangement in Q1. They've jumped the most, but they're still the lowest score as we go into Q2. And we really do think that this raises some questions. You know, for this group of people that maybe can't afford, you know, purely to live on their own, there are elements coming out of answers in this and other surveys we've done that definitely show that there is an appetite to get the combination right between having own personal space, but also being part of a community. Um, and I think that's really important for us to evaluate, you know, you know, hopefully pandemic lockdown conditions aren't with us for much longer, but still as we go forward, it doesn't mean that the themes associated with what everyone's been through go away. And I think we really need to be thinking about these alternate styles of um, accommodation that look after these groups fantastic and so um yeah i think there's a real opportunity and um, you know for developers to be thinking more about um innovative new asset classes we know that uh co-living is you know really kind of struggling to make its mark in terms of planning and so on but actually you know the share a market, especially people in HMOs and so on, are absolutely ripe for a new, a new kind of product and a new way of living. Um, so, you know, let's see what the future holds. But, but certainly there's, you know, people, people need alternatives um, than being just in shared accommodation. And also it's not just... Um, you know, there's HMOs and so on, but it's also um, people living at home. And it's, it's really interesting, um, not for this presentation today or this webinar, but to see some of our other results that have come up in terms of um, how, what parents think their children are going to do. Are they going to stay at home? Are they going to be able to buy somewhere when they come, you know, of, of leaving home age? Um, or are they um, are they going to rent? And it's it's a pretty even split, but it's you know surprising the number of people that think their kids are going to have to stay at home and not even be able to rent rent or buy. Um, so on that note, David, have you done our little calculation? What's the Thrive score for so, this group of people today? I think there's about forty something of us yep, on and so off. There's been about fifty people. So this is very interesting. So we're at 61 as a group. Um, okay. So I don't know whether people have seen those scores come up on the screen. I saw them come up on mine because um, the girl was giving them to me. But, um, yeah, so definitely a big, you know, a big step ahead of where the broader community is. I will say that, you know, I think not making any sort of, you know, calls and judgment on, the, on this group, but it is representative 
of some of the socioeconomic factors that we'd say. I'd say the mindset of this group is one that is probably more positive people tuning in, looking forward, looking at the themes we're producing. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised that that's above the broader score because we really do go for complete representation in the 2,000 people um, that we're seeing. So I'm glad for everyone here that we're part of a mini little community that's thriving uh, <laughs> quite well. We're getting quite close. I think that sort of also validates sort of that 65 type score that we're trying to, that we think is sort of benchmark um, from thriving overall. Great. Um, we've got two more themes to get through, um, communities and um, the very hot topic of working from home, flexibility. Um, I can see a question that's come up and um, I absolutely want to have time to address that at the end. So, David, let's have a quick snapshot, please, of um, our communities and whether they're currently thriving in comparison to individuals. Sure, and I will move through these, not because I want to deprive people of information, but just to give time for the questions. So um, higher, as everyone can see, no change Q1 to Q2 in our community thrive score, but a much higher score overall at being in at 60. That it hasn't moved, does that surprise us? No, I think in the law of large numbers and things that are bigger mass take longer to move. Um, you know, it's not surprisingly that the community score hasn't moved as much as the individual score. The fact, I think it's interesting from our perspective that people see their communities, they rate themselves as thriving much less than they see their environments thriving. So I think that's an interesting uh, concept. Um, if we have a look at Region-wise, you know, London in both quarters um, topped the score, a score of 69, and that actually was up. They were up by the biggest move, Londoners sort of from 65 to 69 over that time. People in the southwest, the southeast, Scotland and the east of England have been pretty consistently in that group of top five or six. The other regions have tended to bounce around between the two quarters. Um, and then if we have a look at these impact, uh, what impacts our community's ability to thrive. So it's interesting in the groupings here, I think you've got, if you like, amenities and location. So, you know, if we like sort of the convenience factors, then you come back to people and familiarity in a group together. Uh, then you've got, all right, well, what you sort of get out of the reliability and the services. And all those things, if you have a look at their positive impact scores, they're relatively similar again what drops off and is a bit sort of disappointing but not surprising to us is the lack of effect that things like diversity history design are rated in a positive factor if you have a look at sort of the no impact both design and history for example you've got 50 percent of people saying that they just have no impact on the community and we think that that's definitely a an opportunity waiting to be seized about how we get people to relate to those things more and then finally i'll say it's also interesting to look at the negative impacts so things that are rating middle at the table like services they can have the ability to have the greatest negative impact if you're not getting it right and diversity which has got this sort of low from a positive point of view or a no impact but still if you're not getting diversity right. You can see it's got one of the highest negative scores there. Again, I won't, don't have time to jump into sort of the breakdowns, <laughs> but um, back to you, Chuck. Yes. Um, so, Melissa, I think, you know, with your, with your background kind of design, and I think we would all expect that being in our industry, given what we do to have a greater positive impact score, do do you think people just, when they hear the word design, think of aesthetics? You know, what what is it? Why do you think it's not as high? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually going to build on what Nigel already said earlier um, and about the design being invisible, but um, just go a step further and say it's also, you know, infrastructure is not um, visible. So as he was saying, it's I think it's only when something goes wrong. So if something is badly designed, so a concrete block, you know, there's, there's lots of comments about things, then I think people notice it straight away. Um, but the point is, we actually rely on the services that come from the built environment, not on the assets themselves. So I'm not sure we tend to notice them uh, as much. 
Um, and I, um, I think that's also because of what I was saying earlier about there not being many vehicles for designing at a community level. So each individual asset is designed separately and not to fit in with the overall system of systems or necessarily with the purpose of, of helping people to thrive in a, in a joined up approach. Um, so I think if people could see you know, some of the work that Puran's done, I'm sure that people can see that thought and effort have been put into the design of a community and linking the services and amenities and, and ensuring that their environment was con consciously adding to their thriving, then I think it would be much higher up on the list. Great, absolutely. And, and what's your kind of view on this co-creation and, and, and co-design with communities? How, how do you think, does that work? How would, how would you see that working? Yes, I think, I think that's the area where there's the least vehicles and processes set up. And that's why I've got a lot of hope for the transforming infrastructure performance that's coming out. Because I say there's a specific, specific strand on that. And there are lots, you Puran's talked about it, there are lots of um, uh, organisations or, or um, asset owners that are doing it. But at the moment, it's I think it's recognising at, at that higher level that there's the whole vision. So the, the way the system's working together so that we can we, we're looking at with a holistic approach. So I think we need to work on that a lot because I say all other industries get customer feedback. You, they would be crazy in other industries if they were doing things and they hadn't asked their customer what they wanted first and then got sort of feedback on it afterwards. So I think it's getting better. Yeah. Um, I don't think at the moment that we've got all the vehicles and processes in place, particularly at a, um, I'm thinking of a, like um, a town or a borough or a local authority level. I don't think that all the, the vehicles and processes are in place to, to enable it to happen. And if, yeah, if you think of other industries, obviously different scales, but you'd have product testing and, and prototype. And I know there's some interesting kind of augmented reality and virtual reality testing that goes on in residential with a a particular business, Zoku, in, in Amsterdam. And we know that closer to home, you know, we've had some modular homes being built that people can walk through and so on. And obviously the scale is different, but there has to be some thinking around how, as an industry, we can test things um, and, and, and get people's responses. And Nigel, can yes. I just come in? Can I just come yes, in? I, absolutely. I an important point. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of co-creation, co co-design, but, but I think you just have to separate out slightly using people's feedback and, and briefing them in terms of, and, and I think you've mentioned this before, Melissa, it's about understanding their needs and their requirements and how they, they might be using spaces in the future. It, I, we, we shouldn't be going in and asking them how to design a building. So I, I know it's no. a small point, but it's really important. We, 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 we use the feedback to understand requirements and then we have to go away as the experts and come up with the solutions. Okay, and there might be several solutions which we then test for preference. But I think where sometimes it's failed in the past is when you've, you know, it, it's, it's the analogy, isn't it? If uh, a camel is a, a horse designed by committee and, you, and you, you, you've got to try and avoid that aspect of it. We, we, need, a, we need a vehicle that can get us across distance and maybe a horse is better than a camel sometimes. So um, I just wanted to put that one in there. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and just, Nigel, as well, I just wanted to um, ask you what your thoughts were about the kind of people and familiarity and thinking about people and familiarity, looking at the London Thrive Score, which is the yeah, highest, highest, thinking yeah. about loneliness. Can you join all the dots for us on that, please? Yeah, again, it's, 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 you know, it's a fantastic survey and bringing lots of little things together. And, and um, I, I've, I've been working with Lendlease who have a whole programme about developing uh, communities, developing, developing residential sites that help um, reduce loneliness. They call it designing out loneliness. I, I've worked on the office sector in particular, but I know they do it for residential developments as well. And, and it's interesting there because what causes loneliness, and loneliness is a massive problem for, for the UK. It's costing us uh, billions in, in lost, uh, lost productivity and also it, it's a big burden on the, on the health service and so on, which we don't need right now with everything else going on. But yeah, I, I think it's interesting because what, what comes out of that is of course loneliness about connectedness and about connecting people. And, it, and people get lonely or they have this issue with loneliness when 
there's a change in circumstances, for example. So we normally associate loneliness with the uh, older population because obviously they lose loved ones and, and their circumstances change. But also there's a quite high levels of loneliness in younger people starting new jobs, coming to a new city, not knowing anyone, probably li living in a dodgy part of the town and in some dubious kind of uh, residential uh, and, and maybe even links to, to, the, to the, 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 the shared spaces that you talked about a little bit as well. So, so you, so it doesn't surprise me that, you know, lo uh, uh, connecting familiarity in people is high scoring uh, in your survey. And um, and lo location amenities also high because it's 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 the it's the amenities and the location that connects you to other things that can help you become part of a community and therefore reduce your, your loneliness and so on. So London's bits of London are quite good for that. You know, the, the London as a city is quite connected. Um, okay, when you get to the outskirts, it may, it may not be uh, so good. So, but but that's why I think London scores higher is because it does have lots of amenities and a good infrastructure and connections for people who, who, who need that. I, I would say as well, though, on, on the design thing, uh, uh, you know, coming from the kind of the design community, the broader community, um, I, again, I think design is a facilitator. So design can facilitate connection and connecting people and it can facilitate um, amenities and so on. So it may be that people are just seeing design as something that's kind of going on in the background to facilitate those important factors that have come out in the survey. Yeah, absolutely. And Puran, do you have anything to add in terms of, you know, um, I guess we'd, we'd like to see that, that Thrive score go up in terms of communities. I think a bit of a curveball question for you in, in your developments that you've created and, and specifically, um, I've forgotten the name of it now, which is very good for a... <laughs> the bed one, was it? Is it is yes, one yes, yeah. that was it. Um, you know, did you have a strong sense of community within that building? And, and second part of the question, was it... Was it organized by you as developers or managers or was it an organic community growth that, that kind of happened? Yeah, so, so that was actually in partnership with the Peabody Trust and it was a mix of 10 years you know, um, uh, there. And, uh, um, you know, we were designing that in the, in the late 1990s, so, 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 so a very long time ago. Uh, and to be fair, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say we learned as much how not to do things as how to do things, but we got some really you know, really interesting results. So the average person knows, uh, at BedZ, knows 20 of their neighbours by name, which is something like four times the UK average. So a real increase in neighbourliness. And that really played out, you know, I, I lived there for 18 years as well. Um, it, it really played out in, in terms of, you know, having a, a Facebook group and, and and so, you know, anyone want any cake because we've, you know, got leftover cake from the party, you know, today from our kids' party today. You know, so, um, and, and then through um, lockdown as well, you know, neighbours helping each other um, uh, in lockdown. So neighbourliness, in fact, the closest, um, I think, uh, factor which links to uh, a rise in loneliness is actually a drop in neighbourliness is, 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 is the single most correlated uh, uh, factor on that. So if we can create places where neighbours know each other, and that for us was really pretty, uh, you know, I'd put it down to um, mainly just to getting rid of cars uh, from the centre of the development. So reducing the number of cars, creating you know, the centre of the development completely car free so kids could play there without their parents worrying ab uh, uh, about them having to cross the road or anything like that. Uh, then the parents meet each other. They start talking to each other. You couldn't walk straight out of your front door into your car. You have to walk past your neighbours. And even though, you know, the Brits are notoriously reserved, you know, you, you walk past someone, you know, having to smile and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it used to take me half an hour to do the recycling because you, you'd end up chatting to your neighbours. Um, and there were all sorts of things which, which happened. You, you, you know, we were having trouble with a, a young kid who was um, uh, uh, creating a bit of trouble. But, but it, it was then the community chatted to the parents and sorted it out before it became an issue for the police, for example. So, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we are designed to live in communities and we don't 
uh, design places uh, to create those communities uh, and, and that neighborliness. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a big, a big part of our, our, our potential here in terms of thriving and, um, uh, yeah, to create those physical communities, not just virtual communities. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm very conscious of time, so um, I think we can we can wrap this up. But Gail, could we have our um, our final, our second and final poll, please? And um, David, if you if you take us through this in a whiz, and then we can hear from our panelists. And we have a couple of questions. If, if people have to sign off, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll keep going for an extra couple of minutes. Sure. So just super quick through here. Um, interesting sort of current 2.2 days people expect in the future two days per week um there's one step we haven't got up here which is what people would like and that is much closer to that um number of 2.2 so people so the gap between if you like expectations and what people would want is about 10 percent the same as it is between the current um and the expectations interestingly enough um there's 46 percent of people that have been working full time. And I think that stat might during the pandemic over this whole time, but hasn't really changed. That might surprise people about the level that's been there. 25% currently working from home full time, and that's expected to drop to 18%. And just one subgroup that I'd really like to pull out might be surprised, but again, the numbers are so stark. The difference in demographics. So if you're currently earning 40K and above, it's 27% of people are only working full-time on site or in the office, 63% if you're earning less than 20,000 a, a year. I mean, and that number flips on its head. If you look at the people that are three days and more from home at the moment, it's 50% of people, 57% of people over 40K, and it's 26% of people below 20K. So again, a massive difference in this working from home in, in terms of the socioeconomic breakdown. And it's, and it's what we saw in the Thrive, the Thrive score as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, David. So um, yes, as we said, a hot topic, and obviously Nigel's been writing his book, um, Beyond the Workplace Zoo, on all of this type of, you know, this type of stuff. So Nigel, what's the kind of um, psychology around working from home? What's the best, best mix? Um, is there a good mix? Um, and and what, what is the future of the workplace? How can we, we create places that are better suited to individuals' needs? It's a big question for two minutes. Or one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I, again, um, uh, there's been lots of surveys on how many days people anticipate spending in the office and, and uh, it's, it's coming out two to three days typically. But I think we have to appreciate that there's also the range and there are people that want to come back into the, the I'm talking offices particularly, but want to come back to the office five days a week and there's others who just don't want to come back at all. And it depends on lots of factors. So obviously the role of, of uh, their job, their function, uh, their management and, 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 and the, and the organisation. We've seen big differences from the corporates, what they're saying is going to be the new norm. Um, but also it's things like uh, uh, personality, your psychological preferences and your personal factors. So again, we, we, we know that, the, uh, and, and it relates back to some of your results there, David, that people who've got homes where they've got space to have rooms uh, where they can work without distractions from, from their, their dependents or, or fr fr from other people in the household um, are more likely to, to, to say that they're going to work from home more often because they've got the facilities, they've got the space, they've probably got the equipment that's been provided for them and so on. So lots of personal factors. Um, but I think it is going to be this two to three days a week, uh, as you pointed out. And I think the other mistake we make is that we're thinking of it quite binary, thinking, oh, right, home is where everyone's going to do their focused and concentrated work. And the office is where people need to come for that social interaction, collaboration, teamwork, um, brainstorming, knowledge sharing and so ever. But again, my, my warning there is just be careful. I think there are those groups of people who don't have the space at home to do focused and concentrated work. So we need to provide for them in the office as well. And um, again, the, the, I, I do get worried because some of the 
uh, senior real estate professionals at the moment, they're saying, well, if people are only in the office two to three days a week, we can half our space. But my view is that we've been increasing densities in the offices over the last 20 years. Over the last 20 years, densities have increased by 40% that have created these high dense, overcrowded, uncomfortable workplace zoos. And now is a golden opportunity, yes, to take away desks, introduce the agile working, but then reduce the density and also use the spare space for things like either collaboration, social areas, and those areas for focus and concentration as well. So we've got quite a bit of work to do in the office sector, but um, whilst COVID is sad, I think it's also provided this golden opportunity to rethink uh, our offices uh, and also our homes. Um, just a side note, I'm already thinking that, hey, if I'm only gonna be going into London two days a week, I can now move to the Southwest and I can probably get a bigger house for my money and I can have a better home office facilities. And I'm sure other people are thinking that way as well. So the, the home office uh, is definitely gonna be part of the, what people are looking for going forward with their new homes. Great, yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, I think we've seen in some of our, um, pro, you know, client work recently is is this, you know, real desire for space to be able to work work quietly, and it relates back to David's earlier comments with sharers. You know, so many people, young people, have been sitting on their bed working for months on end. I mean, let alone, you know, is that bad for your posture and you know your or everything to do with your physical body, which surely has a, an effect on your ability to thrive. So there's there's all of that to take into consideration as well. Um, any final comments, Melissa Pro? And I know yesterday what we were discussing was about flexibility rather than being prescriptive. Um, you know, thoughts on that, Per? And you you're being flexible. You're not working currently from. Well, I'm, I'm working from France, actually, so I'm from yeah. Southwest France. Yeah, um, but would, would you have done that previously? Uh, no, not at all. I think you know, and now people are expecting me to turn up for meetings, which so. <laughs> 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 is not so good. But my um, my points would have been uh, diversity and digital transformation. I think so. Um, what building what David said about I think that's invisible at the moment. I don't think it's been so obvious to people that um, that there might be a diversity issue behind the working from home. And so I think that as that becomes more obvious and things like this survey start to come out, I think people might start having to think about that more carefully then. And and even the language that we use and and thinking about the future because it's not actually everyone. So everyone's talking at the moment about everyone can work from home. And actually, it's not. And then digital transformation, sort of going, that's the enabler. So going back to um, when Nigel said that design is, you know, facilitator is an enabler, digital transformation is an enabler. And I think that, you know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And if you don't digitally transform, then, then you'll die. So that's kind of the organisation, but also the person. So talking about can you work from home, that depends on how you know, flexible and mobile you, you, you can be. If you're using the cloud, if you've been given the tech that you need, etc. cetera, um, but also as an individual. So some people just want to go into the office because they want to go into the office. So even if you provided them with all of the, the digital stuff, they, they might not feel comfortable to use it. So I think it will be at an organisational level. And at a personal level um, but that can be some of the things that can free us um, and almost take us in a positive step so the ICG has a digital transformation task group and um, I think it might have been Nigel someone said there are a few positive things that have come out of Covid mm -hmm. and that that can be a massive advancement for us there's loads of advantages we could take from that. Thank you um, I think we need to wrap up David do you have the results of the poll for yes so, I mean, if people can see it's um, it's sort of validating this three days um, a week, that's 52% of our respondents said that the average comes out slightly higher than that at, at 3.2 days. So, again, I think representative of the types of jobs that the people have on this, that it's higher than the average of the broader community that we've, um, we've seen and very much validated, you know, Nigel, what you were saying about where the expectations, and it's certainly seems to be this sweet spot for more sort of professional jobs. Great. Um, I'm conscious that everybody's probably got other meetings to go to. We had um, the, a couple of um, questions, which um, if our panellists can stay on, we can deal with um, briefly, although one's just disappeared. So 
Um, what I do, did want to say was that our quarter two survey results will be posted on our website tomorrow, so conductor.london forward slash thrive hyphen series. If you want to get in touch with any of our panelists, you're welcome to email me directly and I can, I can you know, if you have further questions, so that's charlotte at conductor.london. Um, and I just want to say I'm so grateful that we had a good turnout today and that so many people are starting to think about these things more and more. And um, as an organization, we're about feedback and collaboration. Um, we want to know what you as an industry need. We can ask those questions in our next survey. Um, and there were just two short kind of comments which um, were about the, the high thrive score that we had as individuals. And it was a really good point, which was um, perhaps it reflects the audience that's listening, that people have taken the time to, to learn more about how we thrive and therefore our thrive score ourselves. And I think that's James O'Donnell, thank you for that comment. And then there was a question around thinking that feeling valued and having a role in society um, can heavily link and aid happiness. I'm not sure who asked that. And I think it's a bit of a rhetorical question because it's, it's actually just a good point. Yes, you know, feeling valued, having that sense of, of purpose and so on. And, and that's a whole other topic that we could just, you know, sense of purpose and, and connection to thrive. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, have a look at our website, download um, that Thrive survey tomorrow. Extremely grateful to our panelists and to the BPF. I hope everybody has a brilliant day and does something that makes them feel healthy, happy and thriving. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.